Thank you, Andrea, uh, and thank you for coming out on a rather cold evening. Um, as uh, Andrea said, uh, my name's Andy Fryers, and I'm the Hay on Earth director for um, Hay Festival. Uh, I've also got uh, I've, my background is I was I spent I spent 18 years in the Forestry Commission, um, and I'm recently on a sabbatical at the moment from them, uh, whilst I helped look after my son, who's uh, just been he's three now. But, uh, Hopefully in a couple of years' time I'll be able to go back and, and juggle my three jobs again. Um, so uh, the Hay Festival is, as uh, Andrea has set out, um, it's one of the largest festivals in Wales. It's a, um, it started out 25 years ago. We, uh, it, at first it was a two-day festival celebrating mainly authors, poets uh, and a few actors came together and thought it's a beautiful place, Hay, uh, why don't we have party basically for all our mates, all come down, have a great time, and, uh, and celebrate the best in writing. So that's where it started out 25 years ago, very, very small, and over the last 25 years it's now, it's grown in the UK. Uh, we now have, uh, this year we had I think uh, 700 different events over 11 days, we had 100,000 people come, 225,000 ticket sales, uh, over 800 individual artists participating as, as over those 11 days. And bear in mind, this is in a town of Hay on Wye, which is more population than 1,500 people. Uh, we build this uh, rather large, looks like an industrial warehouse on the outskirts of Hay, uh, which is actually marquees and walkways. For those of you who know Wales, which you've all live in here, at least for some time, it can be rainy sometimes. Uh, and as a result, we obviously have to take precautions uh, I think our worst year was 2006 when we had six inches of rain in five days, uh, but we still survived. We still got through without any cancelled events. So we build this big infrastructure on the outside of, Wales, uh, on the outside of Hay and Wye now um, and bring all these people into, into the, the town. Um, clearly that has an impact and that's one of the reasons why in 2006 I started working for, for Hay um, and uh, looking at how we manage our, our impacts. Um, but before we move on to that side of things, we've also, over the last, in the last 10 years, we've also expanded now uh, into <coughs> other places around the world. We now, have, uh, hay, we now have hay festivals in Spain, in Colombia, in Mexico, in uh, India, in Bangladesh, in, where else are we, uh, Beirut, and next year, I think, in Canada. Um, so we now have these festivals all around the world. But basically following a similar model, which is we celebrate the best in writing, the best thinking, the best scientists, uh, the best comedians, the best music, and we have a, basically a big party in a wonderful location wherever we are and bring people together to discuss, to debate, to enjoy thinking and talking, to try and, and, and move debates forward. Um, so, so we, like I say, we're all over the world now, we're like a rash. Um, and... Uh, we also do uh, other areas such as we've been working with Park Prison in Swansea where we take authors into the prison itself uh, to try and to, to talk to prisoners and we work with universities. We have this thing called the Scribblers Tour where we take authors around some of the universities. We came to Cardiff in March this year and uh, met with, I think it was 400 uh, year three students, so that's the 12, 13 year olds came to Cardiff University. We brought two authors down talked all about writing and, and, and get some interesting reading. So as well as the actual festivals, we also do things out and about within the community. So that's roughly what we do in a very, very um, brief introduction. Um, but clearly, doing all these things has an impact. Um, as Andrea said, we started the Green Print programme in 2006. Um, it's now become what we call our Hay on Earth programme. Um, and there were three things which we set out to do. The first thing was looking at our own impacts. What do we do? How do we manage the festival? How do we look at how we reduce our own impacts? So whether that's on energy sourcing, or whether it's on waste, or all those different areas, what can we do to reduce our own impacts? The second area was we obviously have thousands of people coming to Hay or our other festivals. How do we manage and mitigate the impacts that they have? So whether the transport or the accommodation, how do we actually look at ways of managing and mitigating their impacts? And the, the third area which Hay on Earth programme looks at is uh, how do we stimulate, how do we engage people in debates, 
and how do we raise the, and progress the arguments around, in my case, around sustainability, right? sustainable development, around climate change, around those, the big issues which we are facing at the moment. So whether it's actually programming speakers from the different elements of the argument, whether it's bringing politicians together, whichever element it is, it's how do we actually try and, and get people to discuss and debate in an open, in open manner to move the arguments forward. Now, the, this is just a sort of a few of the things which we are doing and sort of some of the messages which we're trying to put out about, about what we do. Um, solar heating is one of the things we try and do. We've been using it now to power some of our hot water within some of the elements. You've got to remember this is a temporary structure which we're putting up. So it's, very, it's quite a lot of what we do is we don't have a building like this where we can put up massive solar panels and all those sort of things. Whatever we bring in has got to go down. We have a farmer's field which we rent basically. Um, and so we, after a month after we, we, the festival finishes, when all the marquees are gone, there's sheep all over the field again. So we can't put infrastructure in there. We can't actually build things in. So whatever's in there has got to be able to be brought back down again. So we've been working various companies to see how we can implement so, uh, things like solar water heaters. This year we managed to reduce some of our um, electrical supplies by, I think, by several kilowatts of, of energy by actually using these. Uh, and getting the right kind of panel for this kind, this kind of climate. The first time we used it, we actually had some which were brought in from Spain and designed for a Spanish climate and didn't work anyway. It's detail you don't need to know. Um, transport is one of the big issues we have. Um, there's a... Hay is in, like I said, in the middle of Wales. There's no train station. The nearest train station is in Hereford, which is a good 45 minutes away. Um, so in order for people to get to Hay, they've either got to drive or use, normally, a fairly poor public transport network. Um, so we've been working with... Uh, uh, we, we, we put on a number of different public transport initiatives to try and improve the impact of, uh, of people when they travel to Hay. So whether that's a bus service from Hereford to Hay, regular one, which runs like, 10 times a day for the 10 days of the festival, and that's working with a private company. We, 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 we share the risk, we cover the costs, and if it makes any profit, we share the profit. Um, and so far it's always made a profit, which is great for us and great for the, bit, great for the company. Um, Sky, who are one of our main sponsors, provided with minibuses, which we use to go around the local villages. Of course, it's not, with, it, with it being a very small town, our biggest problem is accommodation. So all the people who come to Hay, they've got to stay somewhere, they're going to stay overnight, to get by public transport from Hereford to Hay. How do they get out to the outlying villages to actually stay in their accommodation? So we put these minibuses, minibuses on, which basically run around the local villages as a, as a little network shuttle bus. Car shares, of course, we push. And we've been working with this company called, um, uh, what are they called? Um, I can't really anyway, they are based in Hereford and they run rickshaws, <coughs> cycle rickshaws. Um, and they've, they've, uh, they've been doing a lot of work running, um, doing the last mile delivery for people like DHL in Hereford, but they also do a lot of passenger mileage as well. So they come down and do something as well. It's only a small impact, but it's part of actually trying to get people to think about their transport as well. I should say these, these slides are ones which we put up during the festival in the run-up to all of our events, which is why they read slightly, might read slightly <coughs> early. This is part of our way of communicating with people about what we do. So waste, obviously, is one of the obvious ones that people have to think about. Um, we've been looking at uh, recycling most of our waste now for, since 2006. It's a big problem. It's a massive, massive issue for us. But one of the big, one of the big things is, of course, that, is that we save money for every tonne we, we send to recycling rather than to landfill. We save about £50. Pounds on the costs of actually sending one to the other. So it actually is cost effective to do that now. Doesn't mean to say it's not difficult, but we do it. Um, it's amazing how many, I mean, just here tonight, we have a bottle of bottled water. And it's amazing how, how many bottles of bottled water we used to get through before 2006, before I basically banned them from our staff using them and from tried to ban them from being sold. It's not always easy. Um, but just simple things like putting the standpipes around the site where people can fill their own water bottles up. It's an easy solution and one which actually makes a direct impact and saves us money. Um, I mentioned that one of the things we'd like to do is try and, and, and engage with people so that they can actually uh, make changes themselves. Um, we've been working with the Welsh Government now for four or five years on this scheme called the Green Dragon's Den where they've put up uh, four £10,000 grant prizes 
um, and we basically run a competition where people bid in, groups bid in from around Wales uh, for sustainable development projects. Um, and we have like a we have a, a full day, for, well, we're four days. Each day you come in, you have a mentoring session in the morning. You get to meet the public, and then we have an hour long. Uh, public voting system where you can sit down, you, you pitch your idea, there's four dragons and the public get to vote on the best idea. And uh, this is one of the ideas we had. This is actually the guy from, um, uh, where's he from, come on? Gadget Show. Gadget Show. See, someone's listening, it's good. <laughs> Uh, so he's in the Gadget Show, he was actually during the festival, he came and he tried this buggy out which had been developed as part of the Grant Aid programme which we'd um, funded through the festival. Um, and this is a bee bug scheme which is now developed even further now and they're now rather than using these buggies which they'd converted basically from being petrol buggies into electric buggies which are fairly ramshackle, um, they've, now, they've now done a deal with Renault and they've now got I think the biggest, the largest conglomeration, it's not the, that's the right word, of Renault Twizzies which are these little two-seater electric cars uh, in, I think pretty much in the UK, there's now, I think, eight of them based in the Brecon Beakers National Park. And they're being used by, for, from, for within the tourist industry by hotels and campsites, so people come to the, come to the Brecon Beakers National Park and then use these little electric cars to, to whiz around. Which is, which is really interesting from Renault's perspective because actually they always thought these little cars would be it's city urban cars, and actually they've, they've been having a really big impact in a, in a very rural area such as uh, Brecon Beaks National Park. So um, it's been a really nice project both for the Welsh Government to be supporting but also for us to be involved with actually is how you can bring people together, which is what Hay does, we bring people together and then have an impact afterwards as well. Um, one of the things obviously uh, offset is one of those areas which people always talk about, you know, you, you can only do so much and then what you do is offset the rest. And it's this, uh, if you're au fait with the whole sustainable development area and climate change, so you'll know that this offsetting is, has mixed um, successes, if you like, mixed issues around offset. So what we decided to do is rather than invest in some tree planting scheme where we had no idea what, how it would be managed or what the impacts would be, is we would look more about local off offsetting and so we looked to actually say so how much offset should we be doing in this case this year uh, was three years ago now we bought a thermal imaging camera with our offset money and basically then worked with the local community to go around and uh, survey houses buildings schools to say look this is where your heat loss is you need to start looking at insulation and we've done around about 130 buildings now working with our transition town group uh, to survey buildings. So it's a way of actually engaging with the community, our local community, and supporting them to make direct changes. So that's roughly what we are trying to do at the moment. Um, and, but this, this, this is about legislation. This, this talks about the red tape and about trying to make people do things. Because all those things which we're doing we don't, we don't have to do any of those things. No one is forcing us to do those things. No one is forcing us to, to set our waste. No one is forcing us to put public transport on. There's no, there's no drive there from outside particularly. Um, there is pressure from within our customer base and there is pressure from within the media and there is some pressure from government. Um, but it's not the same as you have to do. So we've been working with Andrea this year on, uh, well, several years now, but this year, Andrea um, uh, and Brass, which is the... Is it ERC Research Centre? There we go. The ERC Research Centre. It's good. We're like a double act, aren't we, here? <laughs> it's like Ant and Deck. Um, the, uh, so we, we, to do some research on our customers to find out exactly what they were doing and what they thought about our sustainable development issues. Um, so a little bit of feedback. 90% of people... Uh, came to Hay because of the speakers and events, not because we were a green festival. Only two people, uh, two percent of people, uh, came apparently because we are a sustainable festival. That's not surprising. We're a festival of ideas. We're not. A, we're not a green festival. So it's not surprising that people didn't come because we were a green festival. But ninety percent of people strongly or uh, strongly agreed or agreed that we should be taking some care over our impacts. So most people, the vast majority of people, thought we should be taking care of our impacts. And also 90% of people thought that they should be taking care about what their impacts were. So there's a strong drive, a strong correlation between people coming about what they think we should be doing, what they think they should be doing, and what we are trying to do. 
So there is pressure there, and there's a direct correlation between those two. There are issues that most people don't seem to realise what we are doing, which is a, an issue for our communications uh, policy, but at least we know there is a desire for people who are coming to our festival that they want to see us making change. So even though we don't have to, there's clearly a business reason for us to do it. But as I said, this is not about the, um, the, the business issues or the, 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 sort of the, the moral reason for doing it. This is about how we try and drive change. So the, um, there was, there's lots of um, legislation around environmental legislation. There's lots of things which we have to do as a festival. Water pollution is a clear one. We can't, we can't, there's legislation about what you can put into water, into water supplies, water sources. Noise pollution. There's laws about how much noise you can do. And we have people coming out with little instruments like this thing here and saying, no, you've, no, you've, you've, you've exceeded your decibels, you need to turn that down a bit. We've got air pollution uh, issues. You, you can't pollute the air too much. You've got there's, there's policing laws about how we can police what things. There's construction laws about how we should build things. There's health and safety issues. We've got to apply about health. There's highways laws. There's lots of statutes and lots of laws around all those issues. But there's almost nothing around climate change. There's almost nothing around those sorts of areas. Nothing driving that side of things. It's this, I, I, you may have seen this sign before, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not one I've seen, it's one which I've, I've seen in other people's you, you've used. There's lots and lots of talk around, about, around climate change. There's some very big ideas, but there's nothing yet out there which really addresses the solutions, the seriousness of it. Um, it mostly relies on people doing the right thing. Now, um, I, I, I use the example of the, the, the things like the, the single-use carrier bag Act, which is, is wonderful in itself. You know, it was passed in October 2011 and has seen real change in Wales for cutting the amount of plastic bags being used within Wales. It's, that's, that's great. But in terms of its overall impact on climate change, on the environment, tiny. Okay, it will have an impact on waste going into the oceans, but its overall impact is tiny. And there's a danger that actually people think, well, I've done my little bit, I've done my plastic carry bag, I don't need to do anything else. And this is what I see as a sort of, the, the, this, this is the the carrier bag, this sign of sharp edges, and this is the climate change bit, also the bridges out ahead. And that's what we're missing, with all this shouting going on at the moment about the smaller issues, we're doing all this, doing this, but we're not addressing the major issue. That's still in the small print, the big issues about trying to drive change. That's not to knock the, the plastic bag legislation, just to say. It's good, but we need to do, be, do more. So I, I, I believe that, that we are in a similar situation now as to where we were if you look at the history of how health and safety legislation was being developed. Uh, this is a real picture. <coughs> not from this country, I don't think. Mainly because of air conditioning, we don't need it. It's not hot enough. Um, if you look at, at how uh, health and safety legislation was developed, um, at first it, we relied on people wanting to do the right thing. You know, factory owners or businesses going, it's not right to injure people, it's not right to kill people, so we'll look after them. The vast majority of people didn't give a damn. You know, if you down the mines or everything, if you died, you died. It's, that's part of business. So in 1833 was the first bit of health and safety legislation, which was the Factories Act. And that's, that was brought in to try and start preventing injuries to children. You know, we actually had to start forcing, because actually there were so many injuries occurring, we actually need to start saying... You need to stop doing this. You're not right to do this. And if you won't do it without, if you won't do it because it's the right thing to do, we need to stop you doing it. And there's been various industry uh, and mining acts followed over the, over the coming years, um, based normally following some kind of major incident. So 30 people got killed here, so we'll introduce a mining, a, a mining act. And 40 people got killed here, and slowly developed up until we reached 1974, when finally the Health and Safety Act was basically set the bar for health and safety legislation. And it's been, it has been much maligned. It's, it's made massive changes in this country in terms of health. It's made our businesses much safer and a much place, safer place to live. It has been much maligned over the last few years, mainly due to uh, poor interpretation rather than actually the act itself. 
But the fact is, the act is there, and it has driven change, because people weren't willing to make a change themselves. There's still other examples of where we've had to bring in legislation to drive change. The CFCs, which were, were, were uh, resulting in the ozone layer hole, massive problem. What do we do about it? We need to try and, and bring legislation to phase it out. And in 1987, the Montreal Protocol was signed, which has agreed a drastic reduction in CFC usage. In 1989, the EU banned, well, phased in a ban of production of CFCs by, t by the year 2000. And in 1990, the Montreal uh, Protocol was strengthened to eliminate CFCs by the year 2000. Still hasn't quite happened yet, but the fact is CFCs were cut out of most usage and the ozone layer does seem to have at least have repaired itself to a greater or lesser degree. It is at least worked. The main reason why it worked of course is we were able to find an alternative fairly easily so business was able to carry on. Um, but the fact is they were forced to do it. If they hadn't been forced to do it, it would have still carried on as because CFC was the easy one to use. Other areas where we have, we have said it's not right that you can just produce what you want, it's not right to rely on goodwill to, to drive change, is things like fire retardant sofas. You can't buy a so you don't think it's right, it's illegal to sell a sofa or mattress in this country which doesn't conform with fire safety laws because so many people were dying because they were setting fire to mattresses. Now you would think it would be an obvious thing to do for business to, 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 to provide a mattress which was safe, but if, it's cheap, if, if it was cheaper not to, they provided one which was not safe. So the law was there because it said, actually, we cannot rely on people to do the right thing because there will always be people to undercut. There will always be people to find a cheaper way of doing it, and that puts people at risk. And the same thing with kite marks. The interesting thing about kite marks is not actually a legal requirement to have a kite mark, but most, most businesses in this country will not sell toys, for instance, which don't have a kite mark because it says it's a certain standard, and we don't want our children to be injured by toys which are substandard. So we know that, that we, we, it's feasible to do things to drive change within businesses when we want to obtain an outcome which doesn't rely just on people's goodwill. Now clearly, there is, you know, the Welsh Government actually is, is leading the way um, uh, pretty much in, in the world on sustainable development and on climate change legislation. The Sustainable Development Bill, which, as you might be aware, has been out to consultation. It's going to be a white paper by Christmas, hopefully, um, and will be voted on probably next autumn and hopefully then enacted in its full powers by 2015. It's, it's a long time. These things take time to enact, and it's, as my clock says, it's ticking away, and we don't really have a huge amount of time to develop this change. Now, the State Development Bill is only going to address essentially what happens with, it's basically taking the Welsh Government's uh, uh, laws which, which, which they've enacted within the Welsh Government and applying it across the, the state sector. So it's still not going to have massive, it's still a massive impact on the private sector other than the state sector will be demanding of the private sector certain things. It will drive change, but it's going to take quite a long time to come through. And of course, that's depending on it actually getting through in the format which it already is looking at at the moment. I know it's being watered down to a certain extent already because various vested interests get into it. So we know that, um, you know, that there, there is legislation in the, in the offing, and, this, and this, this will hopefully drive big change. It hopefully will make a difference. But I think there's other areas where, within my industry or the events industry, we can actually look at. How do we do this without primary legislation? How do we increase red tape? And Osborne has been going, George Osborne has been going around saying, businesses, we need to get rid of red tape because actually businesses don't need red tape because actually it, it stifles business. Well, it, certainly you can have too much red tape and of course there's some examples, always, you can always find an example of red tape or legislation which is not good, has been written badly or is, is no longer fit for purpose. But actually, I think as, as we've been talking, some red tape is necessary. It's necessary because actually it helps to set a level playing field. It, it, it enables people to know where they're heading for, and it provides safety for, for customers and consumers. So 
without going to legislation, I, I mean, I, I can influence legislation to a certain extent as much as you all can. We can all write to our MPs, we can all, you know, petition, we can all be party of that. But as an individual, I have, I have very little say over what's, what the Welsh Government or the, or the Westminster are going to write in their legislation to drive tri climate change difference. What I can do is try and influence within the local sector. And I've recently uh, been, been seconded to Powys County Council for two days a week um, on this, uh, what's called the Zen Project, which is a, it's an EU project looking at, at impacts of festivals and how, how do you mitigate against negative impacts and how do you manage, how do you maximise the positive impacts. And one of the things which is not really part of the project, but because I'm now seconded to Powys, I'm starting to dig away because I'm coming it from a festivals background and I can say, well, I've I can see from my business perspective what I want to do. I want to see these changes happen. How can I now get the state sector, the local authority, to actually try to help festivals make those changes? Now, there's, there's two ways in which normally a, 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 a local authority or, a, or a, um, a local government has control, if you like, over events. Financing or licensing. If you, if you want to hold a, an event, you, need to get, you have to get a, an events notice, either a temporary events notice or a full events notice if you, if you want to hold it for any length of time. And also, grant aid is the other area where many festivals and events need extra help. So there's two sticks, if you like, there, which can be used to try and drive change without a need for primary legislation. It's just a local grant. If you want to get a license, you want to get a grant, here are some things which you must do in order to ch achieve those aims. So it could be, for instance, uh, you might say, OK, if you want to get a grant, you need to guarantee that you're going to send zero waste to landfill. It could be that you're only going to use compostable crockery. It could be that you, you're going to source, you're going to generate 20% of your own energy. It could be that you have to provide public transport to a certain extent. So there are certain things you can write into a grant or into a licence which will drive change without the need for some massive, great big legislation. It's red tape, but actually it's about trying to achieve an objective without going through all the machinations of, of, uh, of, of primary legislation. These, these are all sticks. These are all ways which is quite easy to beat people and say, you must do it like this, you must do it like this. And that's often the way in which legislation and red tape is used to try to change. But what, what I'm particularly interested in within um, this work I'm doing with Paris at the moment is saying, as, w as well as the, the sticks which we can use to drive change, how do we actually try and influence policy change? How do we actually try and drive change on the ground by supporting businesses as well? So, for instance, uh, um, local government, much the same as most government, and, and often with big businesses, is departments who are responsible for certain areas often do not have any idea or any clue what other departments are doing. They're driving along for, if it's highways, interested in highways. If it's planning, they do planning. If it's just the, and very often they get siloed into their own particular field of, of interest, and that's what they focus on. And what I'm trying to do at the moment is within, within Paris, which I think is, is fairly, is, I, I haven't come across it anywhere else yet, is how do we bring, at the moment, focus on two departments. How do we bring two departments together to actually say, if we're trying to drive change through a grants and license, if we're trying to provide this stick to say you must do this in return for, for this money or in terms of this license, can we, for instance, get procurement? The councils have huge procurement teams. Can we get procurement to actually help to balance that out? So we say, let's take an example. Um, compostable crockery. Now, with, with, if, you're, if you're providing food to your, your, your event, you're selling food, there's, there's, there's a number of ways in which you can serve it on. You can serve it on washable crockery, which is very straightforward. It's China, you give it out, you take it back in, you wash it, reuse it. So the overall impact on climate change and sustainable, on sustainable development is fairly small. There's water, there's water usage, but actually you are actually reusing it quite a lot. So it's actually quite it's a very good, sustainable source. But it's also quite expensive, it's quite heavy, it gets broken. So there are issues, and it's also not good for takeaway stuff, because you can't actually, if you serve it, you've got to take it back in again. So 
The other ways in which you can do it, obviously you can then serve it in disposable containers. You can either put it in, see it in, in, uh, in styrofoam, in plastic, or you can use compostables. Now compostable uh, uh, crockery is, at the moment, tends to be slightly more expensive because it's fairly new, or newish. Um, but the advantage of it is you can chuck it into your composting bin along with your food waste. Disadvantage of any other type of plastics, even, even if you're using PET, PET plastics, you can't put them into a PET recyclable if it's got food contamination on it because they can't actually recycle it. You've got to wash it. If you're washing it, then you might as well use reusable in the first place. So, compost, let's take the uh, argument. In your grant, you say, or in your license, you say, you must either use, if you want to grant your license, you must either use reusable crockery or compostable crockery. Fairly straightforward. If you want that money, you've got to do that. Really reasonably easy to, to, uh, to uh, uh, oversee. Go down, you can check. Am I served on the compostable crockery or my comp Easy to manage. It's a, very, it's a small example. Easy to manage. But it's going to have an impact on those festivals because it's going to cost them more. It's going to cause them a lot of hassle because they're going to have, they might have to move away from what they normally do to find a new supplier. Most festivals, we're, we're unusual in some ways because A, we don't have, we, our, our funding from the public sector is actually quite small, it's around about 10 15%, whereas many festivals and events are around about the 60 to 80% mark. We're also, we have 24 full time staff now. Um, managing our various festivals around the world. So we, we, have, we, we have people all year round working on festivals and events. Most festival events actually tend to be run by two or three people who do it part-time in amongst something else and juggling stuff. And then it's, you know, two, two months before they're sort of, oh my God, we haven't got done this. So actually it's a, it's a time issue as well. So as well as the time and as well as the cash, there are issues around saying you must do this certain thing. So if we can make it easy for people, then everyone wins. So what we're talking about within Paris at the moment is to say to the procurement team, clearly we don't want you to buy thousands of compostable uh, crockery because that's just not good use of public money. It's not good use to have it sitting there stockpiled and it's not, it's not worthy. But if as a procurement team you could run a procurement exercise with your local businesses and say we want, you know, there's 100 events and festivals across Paris. Each of them potentially could have, you know, we're, going to, we're going to say that they have to use this form of crockery. We want a drawdown contract which will provide at the best value this particular item. They don't, we're not going to force them to come to you, which we can't do that, but we're going to use the economies of scale to try and get the best price for this particular item. The event is not going to be able to do it on their own, it's just not worth it. But if you pull all those ex people together, you actually get to a point where actually you can do economies of scale and you actually get something which is worthwhile. And you get a procurement team working with your grants and licensing team to actually try and drive some proper change. Um, now it's not without its difficulties, it's, I don't know if anyone works in procurement here? No, I mean they're not, in my experience, the most Go getting of areas of expertise, but they are utilized, they are very important because they can actually get best value. They, they do understand the process of getting good contracts, they do understand the process of getting, of getting tenders out there and getting best value. So they're very important people, but they're often constrained by quite rigid rules and regulations. Now, what I've been saying to the guys in Paris saying, you know, let's, can we bend them? Can we, can we help me push, how we get work our way around some of these rules to actually get the best for what you're trying to do as a council? You're saying over here you want to get climate change, you want to drive sustainable development, and over here you're saying the same thing, well, can we actually get you working together to deliver a much bigger change by, get, by, by, by actually looking at what this policy is trying to do and matching it up with what you can do to support it? So if we can get them to pull together the best contract for for this example, compostable crockery, then in your grant you say, you must do this. But by the way, we've made it easy for you. Because actually, if you want to now buy it, you can buy it from this supplier. We've got a guaranteed price of this. Just go to them, give them a ring, you can get it. 
And immediately you've, you've, you've nailed that whole issue of, bloody hell, why the hell have we got to... You know, you just, you just, you just, it's dead easy. Here it is. We want to do this. This is why I want to do it. We made it easy for you. And if you can apply that across the other sectors of issues, around public transport, around energy providing, you immediately start to actually make, you might start to drive some real change. And it's quite easy. You don't need legislation. You don't need to actually go to all this effort. You just need to get people to working together and thinking slightly more outside the box. We're early days at the moment, so it's still trying to push them to be thinking differently. There's a lot of sucking of tea. I'm not sure whether that's going to be possible, but it's about trying these things. And I think if you're able to try these things, well, hopefully we'll be able to drive some change. And the other thing about it is you can actually, if you give enough warning to local businesses and local populations, you can say, look, we're going to be in six months' time coming out to tender for a for, for a compostable crockery contract. If you want to bid for it, you've got six months to get yourself sorted out locally. So we actually try and keep more money locally. We try and keep people working together and working within the same system. Because you've got, you know, procurement has to be seen as fair and open and transparent. So you can't be giving, you know, you can't be giving favoritism, but you can give people advance warning and say, if you want to be part of this, this is what you need to do. This is what you need to think about. And there are ways of managing and manipulating the ways in which it's worded and the ways in which it's phrases to actually get what you want to do, which is the best for your particular area. It's not, this is not about trying to get something under the counter. It's not about trying to do something which is for, for financial gain for certain people. It's about trying to get the best for your community. And there are ways and ways around doing it. So that's what we're trying to do. That's what we're trying to do. Try and bend, break, and if necessary, rewrite the rules. The rules are no longer relevant to what we're trying to do, what we're trying to do now, then we need to start rewriting. That's much more difficult. But at least if we don't, if we try and bend them, break a few, then we can start rewriting them afterwards. So if we are, if we're serious about starting to address sustainable development, We've got to start, we have to actually start acting now. We've got to start working together to try and deliver that change. It's no good waiting for a sustainable development bill to come into force in 2015. There are things we can start doing now. There are ways of working within our businesses, within our, our communities and within local government to actually drive change, to change the way in which people are doing, to make them make that change. I, uh, as part of my uh, reading around, I came, ac I came across this quote from another festival, it's not one of ours, I'm not going to say which one it was, um, but it's this wonderful quote which I think just sums up the problem at the moment. It says, uh, it um, on the final day of the festival, it is not unknown to ask the prettiest girls working in the rubbish collection team to go around the campsite encouraging people to take everything home. Now, we can't rely anymore on a method of having pretty girls going around saying, please take your rubbish home with you. It's got, it, we're, we're sure it would be on that now. You know, we've, we've got to move on to actually say, it's, if we want change, this is what you have to do. It's, it's too big a problem now. It's too big an issue. Uh, it's not fair. It's not sensible to rely on goodwill anymore. Um, now, it's not as if I'm some kind of you know, red tape bondage junkie. I, I, you know, there's stuff which I just think you know, we shouldn't be doing that. But we don't have enough in this particular area, is my view. And it's time to set the bar at a level which is consummate with a sustainable future. Um, and to, to just ensure that all of us are working on a level playing field. I don't want any more to be me going, I'm doing this because it's the right thing. I'm doing, I want to be doing this because actually everyone else is doing it. It's because it's a necessary thing and the thing we should do. Um, so thank you very much. <laughs> questions? Any questions? Either stunned in the silence or. Would you, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, hi, I'm Johnny Wilkes, I'm working in the building next door. Uh, just wondering, other than licensing and financing, what other red tape do you think I think oh, it's, there's clearly there are there's things like the, the, the Sustainable Development Act, there's, there's various legislation which is going to be brought in, but I think in, in terms of what the areas which I work in, there's. Um, there are already 
plenty of red tape which deal with those issues which are outside of of, um, of uh, uh, climate change. Like we've already talked about, you know, highways acts and those sort of things, which do drive change. But if you look at what's feasible within a outside of the main legislation, because if you want to, if you want to develop legislation, it takes a long time, and it is starting to happen. And it's, I'm looking at stuff which is I can influence, which I can try and change. So it's more red tape than legislation to a certain extent. And I think if you're looking at how, particularly in the events field, there are those two key areas. Because that, I mean, and otherwise, you can't, if you're going to put red tape into place, it has to be something which people are having to go through to get there. Now, you, you can obviously write in all sorts of easy, you know, things, but the, way, the easy way to work it is to, is to look at the stuff that's already happening and say, how do you tighten that up? How do you add those things in there? And then, how do you actually make sure that you actually make things easy for people? Because it's, it's, it is, the, the, there's a danger with, with, with the red tape, which actually it does make people just think, I, I can't be bothered. It's just too difficult. You just make it too hard for me. And then you get this issue, you know, you, then you get the red tape is stifling business, red tape is doing whatever. And actually, it's trying to make sure we don't, it is trying to get, you don't need to have that much, you just need to identify those key areas where you want to try and drive change. And you know, it's really simple, within, particularly within, in our field, in my field. It's very simple because there are certain things you have to get. You have to get a, a license, and most people will be applying for grants. The amount we apply, we get grants in the most government, we get grants in various places. And there's very little in there which says, you have to do this, you have to do that. And, whatever, and the only little bits in there are very often not checked on. Now, you know, we do these things because we feel it's the right thing to do. But actually, that's the only area, as far as I can see, that's the easiest, the easiest way and the, 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 the most cost-effective way of driving change is just to put it in the existing stuff, which you say, if you, if you, you already have, you get a contract. I get a 10-page you know, contract from the Welsh Government or from Paris saying, you know, if you get this money, you must, you know, and it's, it's all about contract law, it's all about state aid, it's all, all these things, nothing about the stuff which actually I think is the most important stuff we're dealing with. It doesn't take much to add it into those things. But it's actually identified, it's, you identify the areas where you want change. So whether it's waste, or whether it's transport, whether it's energy, um, those, you know, water use, all those key areas, which currently aren't actually covered, you know, it's two or three lines in, in, in a statement, backed up with support from your local, local authority. Because that's how, it may, that's how you'll drive change quicker. So yeah, it's, that, I think it's difficult to say, this, you know, particularly in certain areas, but that's, those are the key areas we think we look at. So what, festival, what other festivals do you think are pushing this, like, hey? I don't know if any of the festivals are pushing for red tape. Um, and certainly, uh, you know, when, when, I, when I said while well, doing this in my office, you're going, what? More red tape? Well, it's, it's actually about trying to... There are other festivals who are doing good things. Um, and uh, there are... But most festivals and events, it's a... We're, we're fairly lucky, lucky in the... In, um, Hey, I'm employed. My book and my job is looking at this, these issues. Most festivals don't have that luxury of having someone actually part of, as, as you know, enabled to actually be focusing on those areas. Um, so it tends to be. I mean, I, I I get called to other festivals to, to try and help them to look at their green policies. But it often is majority are looking at waste. That's the one which they tend to focus on. And the main reason why they focus on waste is because it costs them money. It's about £180 a tonne now to send waste to landfill as opposed to about 120 to send it for recycling. So there's a financial incentive there already to, to make that change. Um, so that's one they tend to focus on. Some focus on the transport side of things. But you look at, you know, I mean, has anyone here been to uh, Glastonbury? Uh, have you ever seen the photographs afterwards of the campsites? You know, it's just the amount of waste there. You know, thousands and thousands of tents and all sorts just left and abandoned. Now, you know, and I, I know Michael Evis, and I know it dis, it dis, distorts him, dis, distorts him? It disturbs him about how much waste is there, but, you know, and, unless we get away from that pretty girl going around saying, please take your tent home, you know, we're not actually going to be able to make that big change, because people just go, oh, it's just a tent, it cost me 25 quid for an hour, it's 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 getting, it, we have to make it, actually, it's legal requirement to deliver that, otherwise, it just doesn't happen. Um, so, yeah. Which department? I work in, uh, in the rural affairs 
So not uh, not okay, yep. environmental side, but uh, it does come in uh, what sort of you But I was thinking about what, what you're talking about there is talking about changing, it is about changing attitude, but changing attitude uh, in um, say organisations like yours drives it does drive commercial change eventually, doesn't it? Because you I mean, you can see it all uh, through all the way that so many of the companies, like the electricity companies, are saying how much what proportion of their electricity is now uh, coming from sustainable energy, and that's not because they're lovely, but it's because that they see that their customers actually want that, and it, it becomes important to them. So that's um, um, I, the. the there's a huge amount that can be done as you know as the public just act as a pressure group, but also acting through. Uh, you know, I think any, I suppose what I'm saying is any body that you're organised with can form a pressure group, and uh, that pressure group can work on the commercial companies, but it can also work on the government as well. As you said, it takes a long time to get uh, legislation into place, and it does, um, and it's difficult to influence governments, but. Governments are, are represented by a small number of ministers, and if you can carry off with a minister, you can be really influential. I shouldn't really be saying <laughs> that, because my, my minister won't thank me for it, but you can do it. Um, and it's what democracy is about, so it's possible for you to, to actually um, put quite a lot of pressure to, to bear. But I, what, I didn't really want to say that, I wanted to ask you um, about what you were saying about. Um, uh, putting together a contract for, uh, say, a call-off contract for the, the difficult aspect, like the uh, compost yep. crockery. Um, one of the things that hangs government organisations up, including powers, will be whether or not they've got the, the legislative power to do this. Would, are, are you thinking that, um, that say, powers would be able to do a Contract like that, or do you think that this is something that you might set freestanding? I, I think. I think. I mean, from from the initial talks, what we're looking at is Paris. It's not necessarily a contract. All these Paris run the procurement exercise, so they basically got, because they've got the expertise and they've got the the, the, the manpower to run a, 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 a thing, a call out. Say, uh, um, you can they can research how many potentially the festivals might use within Paris. So they get an estimate. This is approximate numbers. No guarantees, but approximate numbers. Um, they can go out to six companies, whoever, to say, this is what we want, this is the standard we want, this is why we want to try and do it. Um, and to get them to bid in with a best price based on an approximation of the of, of, of take up. And it's, it is on you, it's out of the normal procurement thing. Because normally you say, we want X of this. We want it on this date, and <coughs> we're going to buy it off you from like this, which is why it's, it's starting to push the boundaries a bit. But it's about it's the 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 the, the, um, the, uh, the carrot to the companies is is that we are putting this into our grant requirement, and you will be the preferred. We, you'll be the one who we will send people to, because we we run the you, you normally couldn't do that because you couldn't as a state you, as a powers couldn't normally recommend one business over another because it would be seen as favouritism. But if they've run a procurement exercise on the back of a policy statement, and they've been open about that, so everyone knows we're going to be doing this, then hopefully, and this is why we're still trying to get them to push the boundaries of procurement rules, they can then say, you will be our preferred supplier for we will push people to. So they, they'll get almost, it's not guaranteed business, because there's nothing saying the, so it's not actually a contract. What it is is almost becoming a, it's a it's a promote it's a promotion. It's, it's almost saying you will be the one we push over the other ones because you've given us the best price f because this is what we're trying to achieve. So it's it, it's, it's it isn't it isn't quite as cut and dry as a contract. It's not quite as cut and dry as you would normally get through procurement. But it's hopefully a way of trying to to try to to provide some support to people who can't normally do these things who haven't got the time or the knowledge or know how to phone around and say and they've only got they only need a hundred. Whereas actually if you've got you know, 100 festivals all need 100, all of a sudden you've got quite a bit, potentially quite a big contract. I think that's, so it's, it won't be a contract, it's more of a just a, it's a promotion, but it's using their skills to do that. So I'm hoping that's how we can get around it. And I think, I'm just thinking now, um, I used to be an auditor, so I was always thinking about what, what the risks. I think to the powers who 
uh, who, who may be taking the contract there, that's a kind of no risk contract because they're not guaranteeing a minimum nope. amount. So to them, that's probably that probably will talk over and make it legal as far as their regulations concerned. And the only effort they're putting into it will be a couple of staff who are actually drawn up the contract and yep. it will be staff time essentially rather than Yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so that's a relatively that's a that's a very persuasive way of I might have to take your details so I can use you to, because it's 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 often just fine. It's just being able to work it through. Because I, I mean, I'm not a procurement expert. I just know that we've got procurement teams and we can use them. And if it's a way of getting around it, and it's a way of actually, like, say, supporting it, and if uh, you can give me, uh, we've probably all got, already got your details anyway. So you give you don't give them to me. I still get you. Um, but it'd be actually useful to be able to just sort of um, to feed that through. Thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, our, our, we tend to, what we what we tend to do with our with our food side of things is we um, can't, we have six or seven different suppliers who, who come come to the site. So they're all private individuals, and they they basically pay a certain fee for being there. And we try and what we try and make sure is that they we set within our within our contract <coughs> rules. We say you must you know be ethically sourcing or whatever, whatever. and we, we try to make sure we have a range of, of different types of food. And I think some of the research you've done this year, which I've not seen yet, but we'll do soon, actually gives some indication of where the food, what the food, uh, the, the most popular food sorts and where people are going most comes in, which would be very useful information for us. We, we get some feedback from our contractors, <coughs> but not huge amounts, because obviously they're, they don't let us know sometimes how, how well they've done. So we might charge them a bit more next year. So that's what we tend to look at. I mean, we we don't do any we don't do any food provision ourselves, yeah. um, but we buy in, or well, we we are the, we, we have suppliers who come and we buy certain services often. Um, but yeah, but we have certain rules and conditions which we say you must do that. And the things like how you serve your food and what you do with your food waste is written very much into that process. So we we, we composted, I think something like seventy five percent of all the food coming back. Out, back out a back stream of, of, of kitchens with all sent away. So it's things you've got to do in order to you know to be able to to be part of, of, of what we offer. Um, but yeah it's yeah it's we we're not looking at the moment at at, sort of at indivi individual f food items and stuff. It's more we you know, we choose a, a particular company and, and most of those are local companies around around uh, hey but I mean we did an interesting thing with uh, there's a company in Cardiff who do African food. God, I don't know what they're called now. They're based somewhere in Cardiff. Anyway, they're just a fairly small. They ca they came for the first year this year, and we said, you know, if you want to come, that's great. You pay us the fee to be there, and you have to. And in this case, you either have to serve on reusable plates, or you've got to serve on compostable plates. And they said, come on, where do you get those from? So I basically sent them a list of suppliers who I've just dug around on the, on the internet and sent them those. Um, and they bought them. They got the bamboo. You can get these nice bamboo um, bowls. And they came and they said, these are fantastic. They're A, they're cheaper than the stuff, the, the, the polystyrene stuff which we use normally. And they're much nicer. So they're actually now using those in their main business as well, which is really which is a really nice thing that I can say, so great, you know, I've changed that business's way of doing things. So you can change people, because they're often they're not thinking about it. But that's something we do, we don't have to do it. And this is where we get back to before. If we can state in the in the, in the in, in our red tape, you have to provide that, and we can actually drive change in lots of those small businesses who don't normally think about it, because if you want, if you, want uh, you know, heat-proof packaging, you get polystyrene. It's the worst, you know, you can't do anything with polystyrene other than just chuck it away. So it's the worst, but if that's what everyone's used to using, that's what they do, until you can actually force them to make a change. I'm not sure if that's really answered your question, but yeah. But, yeah. Okay. Scale and this sort of stuff. Um, 
Just really to add to the points of inventory, we're doing some work at the moment with the Welsh Government looking at um, working with small businesses in the food drink sector at, at sort of um, collective purchasing of food packaging. Um, basically because of the point yep. mentioned, the economies of scale, but also the fact that um, essentially small businesses buy off-shelf packaging, which tends to be worse for the environment than if they club together, they can afford possibly some compostable packaging, yep. this type of thing. Um, and that, that's kind of we're doing some feasibility on that at the moment. And I, I was quite interested in some of the points you were making with regard to perhaps linking in with procurement teams on a, a local government level, because <coughs> um, there are some challenges. Um, really, like I mentioned, with the sort of Welsh government, and perhaps getting that level of sort of commitment. Um, I think maybe on a local level, it's um, possibly a bit more manageable. Um, but I think that um, some of the challenges really that, that we've discovered is, is, is about um, cost, storage space, particularly food packaging yep. because of the origin issues and this sort of thing, um, distribution, and fundamentally getting business to work together as yep. well. Yeah, no, I mean, it's interesting you say that, because did, we did some research ourselves about five years ago, precisely into the area of, of can we get festivals to club together to buy, you know, to do use economy of scale, and we had a little report which we, which we, which we had written, which I worked on with a, with a colleague, um, and we came across exactly those same problems. And there were... We found probably three or four other festivals within Wales who were keen and interested, but we hit exactly those issues. Is how, where do you store the stuff? How do you guarantee that it's going to go in certain places? Um, how do you distribute it? Who is going to look after it? Who manages the process? And that's, and so you know, we, I've had that report sitting on my shelf now for uh, four years. I've not been able to crack those issues, which is why I'm now looking at this other area of actually saying, well, if, if there isn't, if no one's actually buying all this stuff, it's not actually having to sit in the warehouse, it's just about getting the best deal from one contractor, and you might do that every year, so everyone has a choice, you know, and you can do it in different areas, it becomes much easier to supply, because you're not, A, you're not having to get anyone particularly to agree, you're not getting the festivals to agree, you're saying you have to do this, if you want to use this, we've done the work for you, you don't have to, and therefore it just, it makes it just easy. I think that's so... I, 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 cause I, I, I looked exactly the same. I, I thought there must be a way of getting festivals events to pull together, to, to group buy, group purchase, all sorts of things, whether it be energy, whether it be... I mean, energy actually is one where you could look at because it's not... There's no drawdown contract for that. It's just a... But the problem with the festival events, of course, is lots of them are, are temporary. It lasts for two weeks or ten days or a weekend. And so the, most of it is happens on a, on a location where it's a greenfield site, so they've got to bring energy in. So some things are not practical. Um, but there are, it's, I thought there must be a way of doing it. And I think there might be, but I think what the, what, what the, way, the way to do it would be there would need to be a, a company which actually did the buying, did the holding, did, the, did all the sorting out and distribution, and then you contracted to the event, so the company was, was formulated, and then that did it. Well, as opposed to try and get the event to do it amongst themselves, because often it gets back to the same issue. They don't have the staff or the time or the energy or the space or whatever to be able to do it. So then it relies on one festival doing it, and how do you then cover the cost of doing that unless the other people pay into it? And then you've got the addition of how do you actually... Co it just gets quite complicated, whereas you have one company doing it, then you could possibly do it. And it, but it's, it's another, another way of looking at doing this rather than doing a procur procurement angle. Mm -hmm. But at the moment, the procurement angle seems to me an easier way of, of trying, to drive, try, trying to drive some change. Um, because it ties in so nicely in with, with changing the, 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 the grants issues. So you can, ju you can pick them off because you can change the grants each year. You can say, actually, we're going to add this line in this year. And at the same time, we're going to run a procurement exercise and match it. So you don't have to try and change it all overnight. You can pick the ones so you can say, you know, compostables, you can say energy supplies, you can say waste, whatever. And you can, at the same time, you can get your procurement team to tie in exactly the same time. And actually, if you wanted to, if we, if we so I'm talking to some of the Welsh Government people fairly soon, hopefully, um, 
we could actually get different councils to explore different elements. So one council could do change their grant requirements in one angle and develop procurement on that one, and someone else could do something else. And then you don't want it too big, because if you get procurement too big, it then becomes unmanageable, and then you get the big companies coming in, and you lose some of those, lose some of those local benefits. Mm -hmm. So you still might want it on a, on a council scale, but if someone else does the work and develops it, and then you can start to, to share that knowledge, I think it's, it's feasible. But... Like I say, it's, it's, it's not being tried anywhere else at the moment, so it's, it's, it's my view, it's worth a go, worth a try to see whether we can you know, use that red tape. But it's, it, uh, it's the crucial thing is that support behind it. Otherwise, it's just a stick to beat people and then people get black and blue and give up. Hi, Andy. Um, Tony Buffis, uh, I'm an independent consultant as well, um, ex Welsh Assembly Rural Affairs Department for years. <coughs> and, um, um, landlord and restaurateur in the Great Beacons National Park just that, that last week, some of the business. But more importantly, um, I hate festival for the last 10 years on and off, and uh, we've engaged in a lot of the um, the Hay on Earth stuff with Andy Middleton and Simon yep. Hillsborough, etc. The discussions going on there. Um, I'd like to make um, a, a point about the procurement and other things, and then a question on the social element side. The point is that um, although I fully agree with the intention of working with procurement, at the moment I find um, a lot of the issues surrounding the public sector and civil service with pay freezes, etc., any further work that they're trying to do, as well as the existing loans, is um, looked upon quite uh, uh, negatively mm -hmm. at the moment, uh, yep. from my experience um, with, with colleagues and ex-colleagues. So um, all the best with that one, but it's definitely a way forward. But the, you know, at the moment, there's reluctance to sort of look at things whereby they're to hear anything yeah, yeah, yeah. about their procurement yeah. work. So, uh, not down it, but good luck with the process <laughs> as well. <coughs> the point is, though, with uh, the question, Andy, is uh, on the Hate Festival, over the last uh, 10 years in particular, you've developed um, globally. Yeah. And within the SD framework, you know, three pillars, whether you agree with it or not the economic, the environment, yeah. and the social element. Um, all being as more important as the other. The economic and the environment, you could arguably say that they're easier to measure outputs from, yep. where social is a critical part of the, uh, the three pillars. But it's very, very difficult to engage in that social element. And I'm wondering, with the hay being about writing and ideas and developing and moving debate on, with now a global presence, is there anything that you're doing to measure your impact on that social element that you can demonstrate what you're doing to try and develop that debate and move it on? You mean globally or...? Either, either or. I mean, I think you certainly, and, and one of the things we've been working and, Andrea on is looking at legacy side of things, and that tends to be looking not just on environmental but also on, on the social legacy. Um, it is difficult to address, mainly because people come, they get all excited and they go off and it's very difficult to know what they do when they leave. But there are, we do have some examples of, of change, of major change which we can say we've changed. Do you know, do you know the 1010 campaign? Franny Armstrong started. Anyone heard the 1010 campaign? Yeah, it was, anyway, it was, uh, it was 2010, Franny Armstrong came up with this idea of, of uh, of 10% of cuts in CO2 emissions by 2010. That's called the 1010 campaign. And it went global. It was first just the UK and, and then it went all over the world. And it's carried on a bit. It's, it, they had a bit of an issue with some uh, bad advertising which killed them off. But anyway, it, it, was a, it was a good idea. It was very simple 10% cuts in 2010. And Cameron, David Cameron, signed up to it in the first week, I think, or second week of his government. He signed up to making uh, the civil service. Do 10% cuts within by 2010, and they actually they exceed. I think they had about 16% cuts across the civil service. So it was white halting. It was so it was it was actually quite a high profile campaign and was quite successful. That came about on the back of uh, uh, um, Ed Miliband, currently leader of the opposition. Then he was environment secretary uh, under Tony Blair's government. Um, or was he under, under under Gordon Brown? Anyway, he was environment secretary. He was on a train, he, he and his brother are, are, are long-term friends of the festival. He was on the train back from the festival in 2009 with Fanny Armstrong and they were going, 
God, what can we do? We've been through all this stuff. What we need to make a change, and that's when the idea of 1010 came up. So you know, we can say directly, the Hay Festival caused that because actually that conversation. So in terms of some of that social side, things you can you can gain some of it. So actually, you can see things which spin off from there, um, and we know. Some of it is, is more is more difficult, but we can we we put people together, who then gone off and and done things as in collaborations where we can say that and that happened. And if you look at what's happened in in Mexico, you know, in Mexico, for instance, where we have we've been there now for four years, we've um, it's obviously in every country you work in, it's got a very different, you got to be very careful the, the different kind of um, uh, social um, uh, nuances within it. But Mexico at the time and still is. Suffering from from major uh, political problems, lots of killings, lots of journalists being being uh, being killed, uh, lots of drug problems, lots of um, uh, uh, financial uh, irregularity. We had quite a lot of pressure from the Mexican state uh, two years ago because we'd invited one of these journalists who'd been quite critical of the governor, um, and we had, and they were saying you can't possibly put this put up, put person on, and we're saying we. Have to we we either put this person on or the festival doesn't go ahead because one of the things we are we're about freedom of speech, not freedom of speech to the extent when you can just you know abuse anyone, but freedom of speech where if it actually the point is is relevant and is about open debate, it's actually about you know making sure that 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 voice is heard, and as soon as we have people saying you can't do this, then actually it takes away all our credibility. So uh, as we actually stood up and we said no, we, we either have that person or. You know, you, you can't, you know, we, we don't go ahead, and we actually, you know, we actually won that 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 battle. So we can actually say we actually we are in some of those places we are making voices heard, which otherwise wouldn't be heard. Um, but it's it is tricky to try and capture some of those things. And one of the things which we've been talking with Andrew about is how do you survey people, how do you survey attitudes, and how do you capture um, uh, the what people do when they go back out of the festival, when they go back out in society, what do they do in terms of, 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 of um, changes to their life or, or, or the way in which they interact. And it's all very in, intangible because how do, you, how do you guarantee that this thing came as a direct result of that and wasn't actually as a theory, series of thought processes which you'd already been thinking about and this just... But yes, it is, it's a one way of catching... And I suppose the other one is Green Dragon's Den, looking at... You look at what the bee bug stuff and what came out of there, and some of the stuff we've got. There's a um, this year's the four winners in this year's um, uh, Dragon's Den. One of them was a it's called the Dung Beetle by Post, and it's this company who are now posting out dung beetles to farmers to help basically cow poo get it back into the earth again, which removes which reduces emissions. And they've just been featured on Radio 4 or something as a result of the, the money which has come out. So we can see certain things which we can say, this has a definite wider impact. Um, some of the small special on individuals is more difficult to measure. It, it is, it's a tricky one. Yeah, I can see it's a tricky one, but I mean, um, just, a, I, just a perception really is, because I think you do a lot of good stuff. Capturing the larger ones would be really good anyway. Yet the smaller ones, I fully understand yeah. they're going to be completely... Um, well, intangible, you know, how difficult, very difficult to actually get a measure or a, but particularly now you've got a global stance, capturing the larger ones and trying to say, I think, to people, all we've done is given them a stage to develop it. Yep. You're not claiming any business or, you know, the, um, the guy from the captain show now dealing with Renault, but you've given them a stage to sort of go forward. Yep. And I think the Hay Festival can do a lot more of that and try and encourage smaller festivals to put these kind of debates on because no matter how small yeah. something will kind of come of it. I was just you know if, if your your team's collating the stuff it'd be really interesting to to, to sort of see yeah. it's, it's certainly one of the things which we we are very good at blowing our own trumpet. We tend to do stuff and also we 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 we've got now what's fourteen different festivals all around the world. We're often rolling on to the next one before we've got, you know so it's often difficult to capture the stuff when you're, on, you're, you're into the next one before, you, before you've got a chance. But it is important to actually co to capture some of that legacy stuff um, because actually then you, you know you're having an impact. Um, so, yeah, we, we have more talks to have, haven't we? But, yes, thank you. Wales to 11 day event 
funds gone from pay on Y to, to possibly Canada. Um, I'm just wondering what planned environmental legacies the Hay has in the future. What planned environmental legacies? Yeah. In terms of what you're doing within your event, how you think that might influence other events, not necessarily just literature or the arts. Um, I think, I mean, it, it's, wherever we go in the world, we have a similar approach, which is to look at, is there anything else happening in, in that region or that area the same? Because we're not, we're, we're a not-for-profit organisation, we're not there to, 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 make, to make huge amounts of money. All the money we make gets reinvested back into the, into the festivals. So, is there anything else going on in, in that particular area? So we're not, you know, we don't want to compete with someone else. So can we add value? Are, are, do people want us to be there? Is this something which actually we can say, you know, it's not happening at the moment and there's a desire for it, or is there a need for it? You know, are we going to, are we going to be, get back to adding value? Is it in a beautiful location? Because one of the things which we... One thing we believe in very firmly is that if you're going to get people to embrace new ideas, if you're going to get people to engage and discuss things and be open about things, is that they're far more likely to do that if they're relaxing and enjoying themselves. You get far more enjoyable conversations at a party than you do at a conference, because actually people are relaxed and enjoying themselves and far more open apart and far more willing to, to think and discuss. It's one of the reasons why we hold it in the field in, in Wales and not in the Millennium Centre, because it's a conference centre and... I don't know, those of you who go to conferences, it's, they're not the places you want to be in to learn anything new or discuss anything particularly uh, exciting because as soon as you walk in, you feel sapped of energy. It's just, they're just not, you know, our view is if you want to get people engaged, you want to get people learning and exploring and being exciting, you need to be in an exciting, nice, relaxing place to do that. So it has to be a place which actually will engage people and they go, wow, look at this, this is fantastic. I mean, this is room, it's a great room, you know. It's not as good as that room behind there, which is the big debating centre, which is actually really, really quite, you know. But it, most conference centres don't have this sort of thing, and most places, do, you know, you need to be in a place which actually feels right and feels though you can engage with it. Um, and then... Are we going to be able to, to do the things which we want to do? You know, are they going to, you know, for instance, we, we, we've, we've been asked to go to North Korea, we've been asked to go to Russia, we've been asked to go to quite a few places, where at the moment we are debating about what we do because there's going to be you know, very strong restrictions on what we can and can't do. Now, we've got to be quite careful. To actually, some of the places we could actually take some real risks and really push people more than they have done before or we could take a risk and actually we go out there and they say, well, actually, you can't do that, that, and that, and it becomes pointless going there. Um, so it's got to be a place where we, where we know we can, we can make a change by taking things we want to do. It's not, not to be stupidly, you know, rubbing people's noses and stuff, which they don't want to do, but actually about pushing, pushing boundaries. Um, so we've got to be those sort of places. And we've got to know that we're going to make, to, 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 to assume we can make some kind of difference and not have an overall, overall uh, negative impact. So when we did the Maldives Festival, um, which I directed, which was a chore, um, but I, so all of our festivals use local staff. The vast majority of people who go to the festivals are local people. So when we say we're all over the world, the vast majority of those people actually are, you know, 80 to 90% of people who go to the festivals, whether they're in Mexico or Bangladesh or all Maldives, are people who live there. So what we're doing is we bring a few international art artists, we mix it in with local artists, and we celebrate the, that mixture of cultures and we see what comes out at the end. So we get this sort of you bit of melting pot and you see what comes out. So in the Maldives, we did, it's you know, known as this luxury island resort and all those things, you know, but actually, I don't know if you know the Maldives, it's, it's 300, the popular local population is about 300,000. There's 1,350 islands. 100,000 local people live on the capital island, Mali. So a third population live in Mali, which is a mile square. And there's thousands of other islands out there. But the vast majority live on this island because of the dictator, which was there for 30 years, 
and has now just come back into power again after a military coup in February, after three years of democracy. So we went out there on the back of democracy with the new president, he invited us out there, said please come and do something. We went out there, we celebrated, we did it there. Two days later, he's been overthrown, and it's, back, it's looking like he's going back towards the dictatorship again. But when we were, when we were out there, it was mainly at the local population. It wasn't about tourists being able to fly out and come and meet and, you know, whoever, Monty Don or Yung Chang, who came and, 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 and spoke. The vast majority of people who came and heard those people were local people. But we were also able to engage with some, some, uh, some new things, like we ran the first ever public recycling scheme in the Maldives. They've never done that sort of thing before. So we were able to work with their Maldive, Maldives Youth Climate Network to actually get them, they, they were wonderful. They made these bins out of waste. They sat there uh, every every half hour on a tannoy. They'd tell people how to use the bins because they didn't, know, you know. So it was. So we actually were able to drive some some environmental, ch environmental change there. We were given the President's Island, which had never been opened to the public before. It had been used as it had been used as a dictator's retreat and as a prison. I remember I was standing in the in what we were using as a green room, which is one of these small palaces, which is on this island. It's a tiny island, but had a small palace on it. We were using this green room, and I was knock on the door, and this uh, this guy of about 70 came and said, do you, do you mind if I come and look around? I said, yeah, come on in. He said, uh, he said, the last time I was here, which was, I think, 15 years ago, I was imprisoned in this room for three years. And you're going, you know, it's just suddenly you can say, actually, you know what, we actually can make... But if we can actually open doors to people who otherwise wouldn't have been able to do those things. Now, you know, you can look now, it's gone back, it's going backwards at the moment. But, I don't think it's our fault. But, you know, it's, we, there are things we can do and there are things which we, we can say, actually, those are, that's our things which, in terms of our environmental planning, it's difficult to know until you get there. And it's difficult to know, don't take water bottles, you know, I, these things, you know. Here in this country, we think they're, Awful things. You can't use them. We should be using bottles. We should be using tap water. It's crazy to have this sort of thing. You go to Mexico, you go to Colombia, you don't want to drink the water out of taps. So it's no good then so saying to people, right, okay, bottled water in this country is bad, therefore bottled water must be bad elsewhere. So you've got to work around the local customs and local ways things are working. But you can still make a change. You can still get people thinking about it. So in Mexico and Colombia, we say, look, can you, rather than having loads of these, can we get bigger supplies of drinking water and actually get people to be thinking about that process. Or we focus on other areas. Um, but yeah, it's, it's difficult to say because just, each country is so different and each country has its own laws and regulations and customs which you've got to try and work around. All you can do is try and push boundaries each time and say, these are the standards we've got. How do we actually bring those standards into play elsewhere? And are they relevant? It's a very long answer to a short question, but as is my want. Thank you. Um.